Well, welcome back to these studies in this magnificent but mysterious uh, book of Revelation. And so let's begin today and here with chapter one. And here we'll see a glorious yet somewhat frightening revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what a book and what a blessing to us is it promised if we would read it and take heed to it. And that's what we want to do. Well, let's pray together and as we begin our studies in this uh, wonderful book. Father, we come to you and we know that we need you for all things, but we most assuredly need you when we come to your word. So we ask that you would quicken us and illuminate us uh, that we might see you in these pages and be transformed. You said we're changed by beholding and from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we get this wonderful opportunity to behold the Son of God and you yourself <clears throat> through the pages uh, of your word here. So meet us in it, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's come now to this um, first, we might say, uh, chapter of the book of Revelation and really the first verse. I know that we've spoken about it and said things concerning it right from the beginning, but let's read it together. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent this and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. You know, there's something I want you to notice about this. This revelation came from God the Father. Isn't that wonderful to think? The origins of this come from God the Father. They're given by Him as a revelation of His Son for us. The means by which He did it, it says, is through angels who communicated it to John, who communicates it to us. And here, as we've seen, he does say that communicated in the realm of with signs or some symbolism that's here. So the revelation is uh, also a visionary thing, things he saw. But let's also think about this first expression that's here. Not only is the origin of this book the Lord from God himself, uh, but what is it about? It's about Jesus Christ. And, you know, in our introductory time, I mentioned that there are these schools of thought and interpretation concerning the book of Revelation. And we dealt with four main schools of interpretation. And I suggested let's be a fifth one. Let's have a fifth category. Let's call ourselves revelationists. That is, we want to see Jesus. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, there's going to be the future uh, events or future uh, happenings. The future is here, to be sure. He says so that things which must soon take place. There, there is that aspect to this. But don't miss him as we go through these pages. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that formed for us uh, our outline for this book that we said he's revealed to the church in Revelation 1 to 3. And then he's revealed as the Lord of heaven and earth. He owns it all. It's been given unto him. That all authority has been given unto the Son of God in heaven and in earth. Praise be to his name. But then we end on this glorious 
future look at a totally renovated earth, a new heaven and a new earth where God will restore everything back to the, the glory that was from the beginning and then some. It's going to be even, I think, more glorious than it was for Adam and Eve. That God will not be defeated. He will not be thwarted. His initial plans and purposes are going to be fulfilled, Satan or no Satan, lost rebellious men or no lost rebellious men. No one's ultimately going to thwart God. And so we'll see a new heaven and new earth where God dwells joyfully, glad-heartedly in the midst of his people and we with him. That is our destiny. That is our bright and beautiful hope. So here then we start the book on that term. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. He's the, the origin. He, he is the originator of this, originates with him. To show to his bondservants, that's you and me, those who love and serve our Lord Jesus, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel, and angels are prevalent throughout this book, to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. He's accurate in what he has to say. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So that's a blessed beginning. So from the first verse, he lets us know what the purpose of the book really is. It's to see Jesus, which serves we would see Jesus. Now look now at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Ah, now at once we are confronted with one of the primary symbols in this book. It's the number seven. It has a prolific use really throughout the Bible and in particular here in the book of Revelation. Now to the Jews, this had enormous significance and it was used so prevalently uh, throughout the Bible. Just consider some of the, the things we read here. Uh, in creation, it's embedded in creation the creation from the beginning in Genesis was completed on the seventh day, completed on the sixth, and he rested on the seventh. That, to, in the minds of the Jew, became the very picture of fullness, completeness, everything as it should be, full. There are embedded in creation the importance of this. There are seven colors in, in the spectrum. And there are seven notes on a musical scale. Now, you musicians are always going to add the eighth, I know, to complete the octave. But there are really seven in the scale. But then when we come to the Old Testament, <clears throat> we should see there's plenty here that we find about uh, in the Old Testament. There are 279 references to the number seven and just obviously I'm not going to mention all of them here but that's all we would do today there's seven feasts at Jericho there were seven priests with seven trumpets who circled Jericho seven times on the seventh day um, just that God is in this in his perfect way and then, of course, other things. Seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that was a part of the Passover celebration and remembrance. And then the seven lamps and the tabernacle, it's perfect light. All of these had huge significance uh, in, in the Jews' mind, and it should in ours. What about the book of Revelation? Well, 55 times we see this word. Here first, the seven churches. We're going to talk more about that, but let, it, let us understand now that, yes, these were, in fact, <coughs> written.
written to seven real churches. So here what we're dealing with is something that is literally true, but also symbolic nature to it. So there's a literalism and a symbolism combined. These were real churches with real people with real problems that are described by our Lord. And that each one member of that church would have, I think, perfectly well understood what our Lord was talking about. And they were fully capable of heeding his warnings. They would know what he was saying. We are not so sure uh, about the details, but they wouldn't have been. So these were real people with real problems. So take that in mind now. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, the book of Revelation, it's apocalyptic literature. Yeah, it is. It's also prophetic literature. It says that six times in the book. It's a prophecy. And it's also an epistle. It's epistle and letters written to seven churches. So actually it has elements of all three of these within the book. But look at this list. Seven churches, seven spirits, which we'll talk about in a moment, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven torches of fire, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven thousand people, seven heads, crowns, plagues, bowls, mountains, and kings. Now you can see, maybe you're thinking ahead, Seven isn't always associated with something good. Sometimes these are not good things. But it has within it this element that we've talked about or had on the board here. Seems to be completeness or fullness of whatever it is. So let's keep that in mind as we encounter this word again in our studies. Now he moves next here. He says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Now, if you're thinking about this, Here's his greetings to us. Grace and peace. Charis and shalom. These were the two different greetings Greeks would use. Charis and and the Jews would use shalom. They're all combined here. But grace and peace so much fuller in meaning when they come from God. Grace and peace from God the triune God, because each member of the Trinity is here. The Father is so mentioned here as the one who who is, who was, and is to come. This is Yahweh, the great I Am. From everlasting to everlasting, He is God. So here in the first is God the Father. Next is, excuse me, the seven spirits who are before his throne. This is not seven spirits. This is referring, in as far as we can determine, to one spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, some tie this, uh, seven spirits, to a verse we read in, in Isaiah chapter 11. We said that this book of Revelation is just filled with Old Testament allusions and quotations. But here in Isaiah 11, 2, speaking of, of the Messiah, it would be filled with the Spirit. 11, 2 reads like this, And the Spirit of the Lord, so that's number one, shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of counsel, and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. There are seven mentioned here, and some refer to it. Uh, But that's one spirit with seven different aspects to him. So from the Father, 
from the Spirit, grace and peace, and now the Son. And look at the names he uses here for the Lord Jesus. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So, these three names really encompass the entire life of Christ, do they not? Uh, think what we have here. The faithful witness. That's speaking of him, indeed, as the sinless witness in life of Christ. He was the express image of the Father. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily and does. He could say of himself, I have given them the words which thou gavest me. He was faithful in the task that God gave him to, to reveal the Father on the earth. And his life was a perfect representation of who God is in his nature and character. But then he refers to him here as the first begotten from the dead. That speaks of his sacrificial death and his resurrection. Uh, how glorious. And then finally here is ascension and exaltation. He is the rightful ruler of the kings of the earth. When he ascended into heaven, he could say, prior, just prior to leaving, he said, all authority right now is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All right, I want you to notice something now. As we look at this, this greeting here from the triune God, from God the Father uh, and God the Spirit and God the Son, <laughs> look what happens when, when John mentions Jesus Christ. Uh, it's like it just gushes out of him. He's so taken up with uh, his love and joy in the Lord. Let me read it to you. He says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be kingdom, to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. And, and so it is to be, amen. <laughs> Do you not sense that when you read this, that he just overflows? He says much here about the Father and the Spirit. Oh, but... Wow, when he comes to the Son, he cannot say enough. It just flows out of him. And so, look what comes from our blessedness from, from the Son. These are so beautiful. He says, to him who loves us. Now, some of your translation might put it in the past tense, but most of those Greek manuscripts of old have it in the present tense. Think about that. Right now, John says, he loves us right now. You know, he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he ever lives to right now make intercession for us. It isn't as though just once upon a time he loved us and gives us no thought. No, no. This is an ever-present, present tense, intense love that Jesus has for you every single moment of every day. He knows your name. He knows when you stand up. He knows when you sit down. There are no insignificant people with Jesus Christ. Can I say that again? There are no insignificant people with Jesus Christ. And he could say to us in his teachings, inasmuch as you've done unto the least of these, my brethren, that men might think least, you've done it unto me. He identifies with the least of us. And he loves us and he loves you in the present 
tense right now. Uh, our names are written on the palms of his hand, meaning he can't forget. He doesn't forget. And like the high priest of old who carried on his breastplate the 12 stones that symbolized the 12 tribes of Egypt, uh, of Israel, they were close to his heart. So your name and you are always, always close to the heart of Jesus. Then he uses this word, he released us. The, the Greek word is loosed, actually. So it's right to say, okay, granted, I had to alliterate this with loaded. But nonetheless, it's somewhat accurate, is it not? He loosed us, he released us from our sins by his blood. It had to be by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way in which sins can be removed from us. And then he loaded us with blessed benefits. Look what he has to say here. He made us a kingdom and priests to his God and Father. Now that's an interesting thing we read here because in Exodus, the Father spoke this about the Jewish people. They said that the, uh, he, he has planted purpose for the Jewish peoples that they too would be priests to the world, that they would lead other nations to Jehovah, to Yahweh. Exodus 19.6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. <clears throat> well, now you and I are the new Israel. We are the people of God. And Peter seizes on this, and Peter says this to believers. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, we're to be priests to bring lost men and women before the Father. We're the intermediaries. Unto us has been given the ministry of reconciliation. So you're a priest, male or female. You're a priest in the design of God. How wonderful. So he's done this for us, made us a kingdom and priest. But to him, not us, Never. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Then he says this, Now, behold, he is coming in the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. That would be the Jewish people he would have in mind. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. So it will be no doubt about it, no uncertainty about it at all. Here in this verse 7, he combines, as we've seen again, so much of the old with the new. Here he says he's combining something that's said in Daniel chapter 7 in 13 and 14. Let me read that to you. Daniel 7. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there are the clouds, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to this one was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. Hallelujah. How wonderful. Then he adds to this and couples with it a verse from Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Here the Lord says, I will pour out on the house of David to the Jewish people 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, a desire for mercy, so that when they look on me, that is, on him whom they have pierced, wow, how explicitly clear could it be, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. They'll see him and see the nail prints in his hand and feet. What have we done? Much as they did at Pentecost when they cried out after hearing Peter preach and said, um, men and brethren, what must we do? We're guilty. We, we put to get death the Messiah. What should we do? And Peter tells them, calls them to repentance, to be baptized, to receive the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Turn, turn to him and embrace him by faith. That uh, cry still will be there loud and clear when they see him returning. Now, what a wonderful picture it's given to us. Uh, we often think of what it's going to be like for us when we're reunited to the Lord or the Lord returns. But I want you to think for a moment what it's going to be to him. How wonderful it'll be for him. In the words of a hymn that Francis Rid uh, Ridley Havergill wrote, Thou art coming, O my Savior. In the last stanza of that, she writes this, Oh, the joy to see thee reigning, thee, my own beloved Lord, every tongue thy name confessing, worship, honor, glory, blessing, brought to thee with one accord. Thee, my master and my friend, and I love this last line, vindicated and enthroned under earth's remotest ends, glorified, adored, and owned. Isn't it wonderful to think that someday he's going to receive the glory, honor, and praise that's due him. That day is coming, and it'll be glorious for him. Matthew 24 speaks of this as well. It's picturing not just the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's bigger than that. The further you read it, it becomes, it cannot be fulfilled by uh, a destruction in Jerusalem. It's a last day picture painted in Matthew 24, 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Here, then, John begins. And in a glorious note. So here comes this blessed prologue of praise. He ends, of course, here in verse 8. I am, and here is the announcement, is really the Father. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the two last words we find, of course, in um, the Greek alphabet. I'm A to Z and everything in between. I am from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the El Shaddai, the Almighty. Praise God. What a wonderful beginning to this book. But I want you to see, as we've said, this is what is here. Actually, in the beginning of this first chapter, we're going to see seven names for Jesus given to us. He's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the one who comes in the clouds. He will say of himself, he's the first and the last, the living one, and the one who holds the keys of death and hell. This is our beginning, and it's a revelation of who our Lord Jesus Christ is to us. Blessed be his name. Well, now then, we come to the beginning of this in verse 9. 
I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I was in the spirit. Now, when we begin to consider this, he says he was on the island of, of Patmos. Now, Patmos was infamous. You, some of you don't know, Devil's Island was something of a penal colony for the French. But think of Alcatraz and worse. This was the Romans' uh, island for criminals, and it was hard labor. So that John, in, on this island, he would have had to break up rocks or haul them down to the coast. His would have been a, a terrible hard labor under the sweltering heat of a Mediterranean island. And he had been given just barely enough food and water to stay alive. And at this point in time, he would have been in his 80s or more, perhaps, but terrible suffering here. Now, we consider almost unanimous from the church fathers that this was around the time in 94, 95, 96 AD when the emperor Domitian sat on the Roman throne. Domitian, unlike his predecessors, really took far more seriously his title as Lord and God and demanded that he be worshipped, bowed down to as such, all over the empire. And so, if you didn't, then you'd end up in a, as a galley slave, rowing ships, or maybe put to death, or in a penal colony, like we find John here. If you did bow and acknowledge Caesar as Lord, you were given a certificate of favor, like a mark. Now, I want you to think about the pressure that was on the believers and Christians. They're not going to want to bow to him. They won't bow to him, but they're going to suffer if they don't. And think now in the book when it talks about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Um, they, they would, in their era, in their time, these things would have powerful meaning to them and a powerful point of understanding that Yes, we see this. It's prophetic, but it's also for the moment and for their understanding about compromising with this. So John then was scourged, so the tradition has it, and then banished to the Isle of Patmos, which seemingly eventually he was able to, to be removed. But there he suffered. But I want you to see this. He says, I was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I wouldn't bow to, to Caesar. But I was in the Spirit. In spite of his circumstances, he was in the Spirit. You know, I wonder, have you learned of the Lord how to be in the Spirit under difficult circumstances? on your island of Patmos. Maybe never as severe as what he sees, but they're emotional islands as well that people live on. And difficult circumstances, physically, mentally, emotionally. Yes, they're, they're places of great suffering in this world. But he was in the spirit on the island of Patmos. And you and I can be as well. We must learn to bring him into everything. I um, remember the something from the biography of Catherine Booth, who was the daughter of William Booth, who started the Salvation Army. And she was a firebrand just like her father. And she went to Geneva and was preaching on the streets. Only thing is, they didn't allow such things. And they arrested her. And they put her in a jail cell. And she, she writes about something of her experience there, but she turns it into a prayer, and she, she wrote this, Lord Jesus, 
my prison cell is a castle because thou sharest it with me. <laughs> now, his presence does that, doesn't it? It turns even the most difficult of circumstances into something sweet and bearable. Bring him into your life in every circumstance because I've set the Lord always before me, David said. I shall not be moved. I shall not be shaken because he's at my right hand. Bring him in in faith. Cast all your care on him because he cares for you. He can strengthen. He can sustain you. <coughs> Excuse me. So John was in the spirit on the Lord's day on the Isle of Patmos. Now it begins. I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. This is much like Moses, like Moses heard at this time. And so he says next, it was like the, the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And I want you to think about that, the, the order here, because I want to suggest it's somewhat like an order of illumination. First he hears this voice. And when he hears it, while well, he turns to see who is the author of it, who's the, who, where does this emanate from? But he does respond to it. He leaves whatever he's doing. He, he turns his back on whatever once occupied him. And he focuses his attention in the direction of where this voice came from. So he hears and he instantly responds to it. And then what happens? He sees. Hmm. I think there's a, a picture here to us. When you hear the Word of God and when you respond to it, you see more of the Word of God. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and I will love him, and he will be loved of the Father, and I will manifest visually, uh, he'll see myself to him. There's the same thing in John 14, 21, that you have them, you hear them, you obey them, you respond to them, then you see more. Him that hath shall more be given. It's an order here of, a, of illumination. And then what comes next? Well, he says, having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, don't think of these as something like a candelabra that comes up in one stand and then branches into seven different uh, parts. No, <clears throat> that's not the picture here. These are seven individual lampstands in a circle because there's someone in the midst or the middle of them. So each lampstand is separate. Now, Thankfully, we don't have to guess at what this means because Jesus tells us. Look down in verse 20. He says at the very last, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. They are light. You and I, yes, Jesus is the ultimate light of the world. But it is also said of us as believers that we're to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. That God's people, we also are light in the world. These churches were to shine light for the Lord in their cities. But Jesus is going to examine and we'll look at each lampstand and see the flicker and say something about every one of them as he discerns it. So, the lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, 
girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. In his eyes, oh, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, just glistening. And his voice, wow, it was like the sound of many rushing waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face, well, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. You couldn't really hold the gaze. So bright was it. All right, here then is the description here of Jesus as the head of the church. And it is filled here with Old Testament allusions. Now, did John bring these in? No, I don't believe so. He perhaps wove it together in verse 7, but these, he's just describing what the Spirit of God revealed to him, what the angel showed him in the vision. We're the ones who can see the connections here. Look at Daniel 7, which we've already read, but notice what it says here. I saw in the night visions, he says, Behold, with the clouds there came one like a son of man, identical to what we see here. But this one's going to be given glory, dominion, and a kingdom. He's the God-man. He's God and man together in one person. The long robe here, he speaks of a robe next that went down to his feet. Now, there may be other things you can say about it, but in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 4, it describes the apparel of the priest, and it included a long linen robe that was long down to his feet. So I think it's speaking of him as the high priest. Then there's this golden sash. Well, Daniel chapter 10 and verse 5, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz that was around his waist. Same picture, is it not? I think that golden sash, that speaks of purity, uh, sometimes deity, but royalty as well. The city in the end is made the streets of gold. Then his hair and his head are white like wool. In Daniel chapter 7, in verse 9, it speaks of this in the same way. He has hair as white as wool. These reflect to us something about he's the ancient of days. He, he's uh, eternal. In his, but also full of wisdom. These both ideas combined here. But then his eyes, his eyes are like flame of fire. Daniel 10 and verse 6, his body was like barrel, his face like the appearance, you will see again down here, of lightning, just glistening. And his eyes were like flaming torches. It's the same picture because he's the same Lord. And there's a desire here to link these two books together with Daniel and the book of Revelation. His feet are like, he says, burnished, burning bronze, just glistening like it was in a furnace. That, I think, has reference to the brazen altar. You see brass. Brass is associated with judgment. Because there it was the on the brazen altar, there the animal was slain and burned. And his blood is taken into the Holy of Holies, but the, the punishment for sins there at the brazen altar. So I think bronze puts to mind something of judgment on sin. Those are his feet. Those same feet one day are once again going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And when he does, that mountain's going to split in two. And it's going to open up a valley that runs all the way to, from Jerusalem to the Mediterranean to the west and all the way to the east to the River Jordan. And out of that new Jerusalem will flow a river 
that goes into both directions. And that will become the preeminent city of the saints. But he comes in judgment, and there in Matthew he speaks of separating the sheep and the goat nations. He comes in judgment and comes to create this blessedness for Jerusalem. So then, feet. Now, his voice, he says his voice is like many waters. I don't know if you've ever tried to see the be around the uh, Niagara Falls or any other big, huge waterfall. It's hard to hear. You can talk, but it's hard to hear anyone. But this is powerful, powerful indeed. In Ezekiel, uh, verse 43, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Now then he speaks about what was in his right hand. He says there's seven stars. Seven stars. And he calls these two are explained to us in verse 20. And as for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, the seven lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. In each one of these churches, he addresses it to the angels of those churches. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. To the angel of the church of Smyrna, right. To the angel of the church of Pergamum, right. Now, some have suggested that these were actual angels. I don't believe so. This word angel just technically means messenger. Angels are not responsible for churches. They're ministering spirits to minister unto the saints, but they don't rule churches. They're not over the churches. No, I believe the, this word angels of the church, this is speaking of the leaders of the church, each one of these churches. They are held responsible. In the book of Hebrews, it says, submit yourselves that is, let yourself be persuaded by those who rule over you. They may do it with joy, not with grief, because they must give an account for your soul. Wow. That's a weighty responsibility to be the pastor of a church or be on a church staff. That he addresses it first to them, but the whole church was involved in that condition. And we'll see more about that next time. And then, of course, his mouth, out of his mouth comes this two-edged sword. Isaiah 49, 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. And in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, and in his quiver he hid me away. Yes, he, he, the, the word of God is uh, alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing, divides asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the human heart. All, we come back to this idea of judgment. In his face, we've seen glorious. Couldn't bear to look because of the glory of it all. Now, I want you in, in, to think for a minute about this revelation. Is it not amazing to us that this is Jesus in the midst of his church? This is frightening, is it not? You look at this and so much of here is about judgment. Well, John saw it that way. Look what we read next in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, just undone. Well, that's the reaction that everyone has when they see the Lord. Remember Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. He was aware of his sinfulness before this Holy One and fell at his feet. Others fall down before him. Moses, Joshua, take the shoes from off their feet. Job falls down. Peter falls down. Sin lays us low before the infinitely holy one. But look what else we see here. And he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first 
and the last. I'm there and I always will be. And I'm the living one. I was dead. Yes, crucified. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. <laughs> Never to die again. And I have the keys of death and hell or Hades. Oh, praise be to God. Those keys are in the hands of our best friend and the one who loves us best. Oh, thanks be to God. So though sin lays us low, his gentle touch, he, he lifts us up by his love and lets us gaze in his face. And praise God, those keys of death and hell are in our Savior's hands and no one else's in the hands of our best friend. But why? Why such a frightening figure in the midst of the church? I think Peter tells us the answer to that. In 1 Peter 4, 17, he says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Judgment begins first at the household of God. And then he says, And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Wow. If we'll see the severity of Jesus' judgment on these churches, he will not put up with lies. He will not put up with hypocrisy. He will not put up with unfaithfulness, even among his own people. He assesses that condition. And we'll see more about this next time. But if judgment is severe on us who are the children, um, what will it be for those who know not God and obey not the gospel? Sober, indeed. But there is that message again and again to those who don't know the Lord. Flee, flee from the wrath to come. There is a, a harbor and a haven in Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you so very much that you provided a Savior for us. And he, like the Noah's Ark, we can go into him, and when the floods of judgment fall down, we're safe and dry, not a drop falls upon us inside that ark, which is Christ. And we just pray for people around us, that they would have eyes opened by your Holy Spirit to flee into the ark and escape the wrath to come. May it be, Lord, we beseech you and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.